unsustainable logging has destroyed nearly 80% of the world's ancient forests. The remaining 20% and the indigenous people and wildlife that live within them are facing a precarious future. I'm Maylene McNamara and I'm heading into Canada's Great Bear Rainforest where a sustainable solution has finally been found. Stretching 750 kilometers along British Columbia's coast, the Great Bear Rainforest is known to locals as Canada's Amazon. Its 6.4 million hectares make it one of the largest remaining temperate rainforests on Earth and one of the most productive ecosystems. However, much of this forest was not always protected. Seaplane, the only way to fly. <laughs> For years, the forest was clear-cut by loggers. Throughout the 1990s, it became a notorious environmental battleground, with conservationists pitted against logging companies. All the while, the old-growth forest remained vulnerable, which is 7% protected. Patrick, can you tell me what it was like during the conflict in the 1990s? It was very difficult. Um, we were, I mean, you know, the term war in the woods has been used. I mean, I think that essentially we were at, at war between the forest products industry and the environmental community, and then our, our customers were brought into that as well. When did it change? When was the moment when it changed? It changed in 1999 after the German paper makers and German publishers came to the Great Bear Rainforest with Greenpeace. Uh, took every, as I like to say, afterwards they took everybody to the woodshed and said, you guys got to fix this. Uh, the industry made a decision that it needed a, a new strategic approach. Uh, and that strategic approach would be based on dialogue and collaboration with uh, environmental groups. In 2009, everything came together. Environmental groups, logging companies, First Nations and the government announced a landmark collaboration, the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement. This put one third of the forest totally off limits to logging. It also legislated a new system of lighter touch selective logging for the remaining two thirds. It gave First Nation communities $120 million to develop a conservation economy as an alternative to logging. And it established a five-year plan to further control logging in the remainder of the forest, a major victory for environmentalists. Do you think you've changed, Patrick, since the beginnings of the conflict uh, more than 20 years ago now? Well, in the early 1980s, I was a logger. Right. Uh, and that's how I made my living. And uh, so, yeah, I've changed a lot. I mean, I'm not opposed to logging, obviously, but uh, we certainly do things very different today. One of the people of the forest is Marvin Robinson from the Gitgau tribe, who works as a bear guide. Today, a Greenpeace activist and I are with him to see wildlife that would not have survived without the agreement. Eduardo, tell me a bit about this amazing place. It's an extraordinary place. We are close to the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest um, right now, and we're heading very close to where um, the land of the spirit bear actually is. And basically, if you can imagine an area the size of Switzerland, that is the Great Bear Rainforest. How much damage does clear cutting do to a forest? A, a lot of damage. Um, it, very basically, like on a very large scale, if you can imagine, you know, it's taken hundreds if not thousands of years for some of these forests to mature, these old growth forests, old growth trees that in some cases in the Great Bear Rainforest here are 1,500 years old. Uh, it's extraordinary and massive, massive trees. Uh, and for those trees to mature, for the, the, the forest to mature, it, it's all about relationships. And those relationships take time to establish between species. Uh, when you cut uh, on a very large scale and on a large frequency, you are destroying those relationships. And you wipe out the memory, really, that exists in, uh, on the land between species. So Marvin, our guide, who's driving the boat, has just spotted a humpback whale straight in front of us, who's just uh, tailed. So we're going to go and check it out. If we get a bit closer. Oh, it's blowing! Do you see it? It's blowing! That way! Right there! Here goes his tail. It's going. Wow! Oh, oh, God, awesome. this is amazing! Oh, 
are we here now then? Yeah, we're we're here down in a little place on uh, Princess Royal Island. That's a real special spot. And uh, as you could see, we've got old growth forest. Yeah, you could see all the fish parts there too. You so is that, is that indicating bones. that there's some bears around? Yeah. Shall I just wave my arms at, at you if there's a bear? Uh, <laughs> no. It, it, with you guys, you guys just stay all together and you'll be fine. Yeah, so when you see lichen growing like this, it's a sign of a very healthy uh, old growth forest. Uh, you'll only find lichen um, and mosses growing like this in, in areas that are ecologically healthy and um, have a lot of old growth trees. It's quite beautiful, eh? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Central to the deal's success were the people of the First Nations, who are believed to have lived here for 8,000 years. A number of these communities skillfully brokered the deal between environmental groups such as Greenpeace, logging companies, and the government. So what are we looking at here? Okay, here we're right alongside of the uh, salmon bearing stream, and that really means that this, this creek has all the, uh, the right things happening for salmon to come and spawn. So it's either bears, wolves, minks, otters, eagles, you know, harvesting the fish, bringing it up into the forest. And that is why we have all, these, all this different life happening right here on the side of, a, side of a creek. And you can see the moss is, you know, just rich and, you know, the different lichens, everything's thriving off of what uh, this, not only just water, but the life that comes to it helps, you know, replenish the forest. It's a fairly fresh kill too. Yeah. For First Nations like the Gitga, the sea and the forest provided everything, including strips of bark sustainably harvested to roof their lodges. I would probably say that's probably close to, you know, maybe 100 to 200 years old in between there, mm. when this, this was peeled off, and it could be uh, even more. How important on a day-to-day -day basis is this agreement? This to us really helped us in a sense of uh, slowing things down to where it was a workable pace. This is basically like a living monument of our people. So we look at it as like a standing museum, how important it is for our culture. Hunting is not permitted in protected areas as part of the agreement. Camera traps are one way to monitor the wildlife and deter would-be hunters. But you could really see the spots where the bear has turned, just like us with these paws there. You could see there's no moss there. Yeah. All right, how's this thing work then? How do we get this off? I'll take the card out and then you could start uh, dismantling and taking the camera trap off the tree. All right, let's see some bears. Oh, there's a bear. There's a bear oh. right up close. Oh, yeah, black you know, bear. Yeah. So a bear, right, it would, would sit on this log and scoop fish? Yeah, oh yeah. This is really good, one good pool. Yeah. And that's the reason why I chose this spot for the camera trap. There's a lot of really good pooling spots where the fish were trapped. Oh, this wow. One of the images, that very log we walked up, the bear had climbed onto it and walked away. So, you know, this is either early morning or uh, just as it's starting to get dark at night. Our latest word for it is moxcomal, meaning white bear. Moxcom is white and all is bear. Mm. But uh, what everybody else knows this guy is his spirit bear. You so caught him on camera. Yeah, so it's really nice to, uh, to know that he's still using the stream here. Just a 
heart is beating very fast. So, we just, we just saw the mother of baby bear, but it was terrifying. Uh, Marvin says we're very safe, though, because they're trusting us. They saw us filming and they just carried on eating. But it was, uh, it was both exciting and quite terrifying at the same time. So what's next for the Great Bear Rainforest? It's absolutely extraordinary what has taken place here over the last 10 years. Um, nothing like it anywhere in the world. And um, the, the forest is much more protected than it has ever been. This is where I say right now, people in BC and Canada should really step up to the plate and, you know, be responsible for the choices they're making. And, and it's really sad that I have to say that when this is my territory, but I'm asking for help uh, for, for not just the people in BC, but all of Canada and around the world. And to be sustainable in, in our own territory is really what we're trying to do. Great, well, thank you both very much. You're welcome, thank you. more work is required to maintain the delicate balance between economic and environmental interests needed to keep the forest truly safe. But as long as groups can unite in a common purpose, wild places like the Great Bear Rainforest will survive. <laughs>